aperture. Good evening, everybody. Good evening, everybody. Good evening. What a pleasure to see so many of you here. Thank you um, both for a kind introduction and, and a uh, gracious start to what I anticipate is going to be a really um, interesting and exciting evening of conversation about one of the most critical issues that we're facing right now, um, Prison Nation. I'm really grateful uh, that Aperture took on this issue uh, in the way that only Aperture can um, and that we are being led by such a brilliant scholar um, as Dr. Nicole Fleetwood in this. Um, so what we're going to do this evening is have each one of our brilliant panelists speak for about 10 minutes each. Um, and I'm going to introduce each of them at the beginning. Uh, and then we will have what I anticipate will be a robust conversation in which I'd like to involve all of you. Is that okay? Yes. Okay, fantastic. So let me begin by introducing Nigel Poor, whose work explores the troubling question of how to document life and what is worthy of preservation. In 2011, Nigel's interest in investigating the marks that people leave behind led her to San Quentin State Prison, where she taught history of photography classes for the Prison University Project. The experience changed the focus of her practice and the visual presentation of her ideas. She has since moved away from being a solely visual artist, working alone in the studio, and now spends the majority of her studio time inside the prison, working with a group of men on photographic and audio projects. She is the co-creator and co-host of the prison-based podcast, Ear Hustle. Please give her a warm round of applause. Uh, thank you very much. Um, I'm going to keep to my 10 minutes, and you're going to let me know if I don't. Okay. <laughs> so, uh, I'm going to start by briefly talking about the work that's up in this exhibit, and then move into talking about Ear Hustle, which is not about photography. It's about uh, language and sound, but it's very much about the narrative. And I want to start with the Archive Project, because that's what got me to working on the podcast. So um, I did start working at, or volunteering at San Quentin as a professor teaching history of photography class. And the way I used that um, was as a form of storytelling and bringing in photographs as an aid for the men that I worked with to use as a jumping off point to talk about their own experience. And I, I think that's what photography is. It's a bridge for people to communicate and it's a place for people to insert themselves and find themselves. And that makes it endlessly interesting. The work I started with was actually an archive project, so they're not my photographs uh, or my negatives. They were all taken at San Quentin Prison between 1938 and about 1986 by correctional officers as a way to document events that happen inside the prison. So the first slide is just a small portion of the archive project, and I'm in the process of scanning and trying to catalog all the negatives. It's incredibly daunting. Um, and the project has two components to it. One are the images themselves, which are, uh, these are what, uh, this is what's up on the wall right now. They're very um, stark, kind of, um, I don't know, it, you know, they're about, showing us an event. They're not generous images that have, a, um, a, I guess, a gracious narrative. They're a pretty cold narrative. So what I've been trying to do is enliven them by working with a group of men who are currently incarcerated and bringing in the images for them to map and to dissect and then to write narratives of, uh, about what they see. Because obviously what they see and what they can tell us is very different than what an outsider can. And by doing that, they take the photographs from being these very cold documentations to um, a narrative that can express personal experience, um, insight, pain, and connection. And they're a way of talking to the outside world. Um, this is just another example of that. Um, working on this project and talking to the men in there about storytelling led to the idea of creating a podcast about life inside prison, um, which is called Ear Hustle. And 
Oh, sorry, I'm sorry, there's one more image. I'm gonna just kind of quickly go through this though. Um, because this is really where my heart is right now um, in podcasting and storytelling. So in 2016, I started working with Erlon Woods and Antoine Williams um, to produce stories about everyday life inside the prison. And it's really important to say that this is not a podcast about crime, which is very popular right now. This is a podcast about everyday life and what happens once you're inside prison and how you try to make a life that is rich, that um, gives you meaning, and that help, um, considers how you can be a contributing citizen while you're incarcerated. And everything about this project is done inside um, the prison, all the interviewing, the editing, the sound design, the artwork for the podcast. Um, Erlon and I do the majority of the interviews. We bring them down to a media lab where we work. Um, and then Antoine and some of the other musicians inside the prison score the pieces. And the, the stories range from like 20 to 30 minutes long. We had our first season from June uh, to October last year. And we had no idea what would happen when we started the podcast, if anyone would be interested. We kind of expected a lot of negative feedback, but it's been a tremendous joy um, to have it received um, with such open heart. And it suggests to me that people are really tired of the narrative that's fed to us through pretty pathetic media about who's inside prison and why they're there. Um, we've had over 8 million downloads since we've launched, and that's, I think, a pretty significant number. And again, tells me that people are more interested in hopefully what people up here have to say, as opposed to, again, what media would like us to think. So. Um, I'm going to play just a couple short clips from the podcast to give you an idea of what we're about. And the first one is from a, a, story, a story we did called Looking Out, which was about this gentleman, Roach. And he had a pretty difficult childhood. Um, when he was six years old, his mother unfortunately tried to drown him. And from there, he went from foster home to foster home. And when he got to prison, um, he really was, to my mind, looking for ways to love to give love and to share love. And his thing is taking care of critters. So he spends all of his time looking after mice and spiders and snakes and birds. Um, last time I saw him last week, he was really excited because he had just found a sack of praying mantis eggs and he was caring for them until they hatch. So it is, it's really a story about love and, and, and I like people to think about how does tenderness exist in a place where we don't think it does. So this is just a small clip um, about animals. And in the podcast we do this thing called Yard Talk where we go out actually into the yard and ask different guys to answer questions. So the, overarch the overarching theme of the story is about roach and love, but the part I'm going to play for you is um, uh, men inside answering what kind of animal they could be. Oops. I know we're talking about deprivation, but there are two things that can never be taken away from you in prison, and that's your fantasies and your memories. So I've got a question for you. Since we've been talking about animals, I'm curious. If you could be an animal, what would you be? A uh, beluga whale. <laughs> what? <laughs> what? Wow. There's no, there's no rhyme or reason for it, but it just sounded cool. But we did go to the yard and ask some guys what type of animals would they be. If I could be any animal, I'd be a, a penguin. They're super cute in tuxedos. <laughs> They're like the coolest animals ever. And they slap box like crazy too. I don't want to be a panther. The reason why is I like the um, sweetness of the animal. Dog, because I know that someone would adopt me. The Galapagos turtle, because they live to be over 150 years old. The lion, because it's king. Marmot, because they're misunderstood. Everybody thinks they're weasels. And they're not. They're marmots. I want to be a one lunch because it's diligent and because it says they're there. It would be a eagle because they can fly. So that means I would always be free, I would always be safe. Tiger, because tigers love their independence. A jellyfish, because it has no natural enemies. I asked Roach what kind of animal he'd want to be, and his answer is pure Roach. <laughs> I want to hear that. If I could be an animal, any animal, it would be a wish dragon that would only appear when a kid needed it, because my experience with imaginary friends, they were needed. 
So the thing about being a dragon is they eat meat, and I can do that. So I'd have to be a vegetarian dragon. I'd be a vegetarian dragon because I would spend a lot of time looking for food. That's a lot of carrots. That's a lot of apples, um, oranges. That's just a lot of vegetables. Who's gonna unroll those vegetables for a giant dragon? Unless I'm a baby, I said a tiny dragon. Then I just eat those slices of cheese. <laughs> Um, so again, that's from the story looking out, and the voice you heard at the beginning um, with me was Erlon, and that's my, that's my co-host. And one of the other objectives with the podcast is to create um, a, a project where inside and outside people are working together as equal collaborator, collaborators in a professional manner. And, and I believe that that's one of the things we could do to help change what's happening in prison, is to create more inside and outside experiences that are, are as best as we can based on inequality, where people have high expectations of each other, where they work hard and respect each other and push each other to do better. And that's what Erlon and I do as, as a team, and it's really exciting work. So um, by mistake, I pushed the slides forward, but I'm gonna take that as a sign that it's time for me to stop talking. Um, and I'm gonna hand the microphone over. I did have one more clip, but I think we're close to time. So thank you, thank you very much. bio and I'm going to read it but before I do I just want to say first of all thank you Nigel um, and secondly I've had the pleasure of working with Russell um, and seeing him in action I curated this event um, a couple of years ago called Open Season that was taking a look at this culture of confinement that we created for ourselves and Russell was kind enough to come and do live painting um, as part of the, the program, a painting that I in fact still have hanging in my home. And um, I'm just such so impressed by who he is as a person and also by his talent. So before I read his bio, I just wanted to give a personal testimony. Um, <laughs> and the only reason why I won't be doing that for everybody is because he's the only one that I know personally on stage. <laughs> um, so Philadelphia artist Russell Craig makes art on court documents prison paperwork, and discarded items to convey how art helped him overcome a tumultuous time in his life. His work has been shown in numerous solo and group exhibitions. He's also worked with Mural Arts Philadelphia through their restorative justice program, and is a Rite of Return Fellow, a program that invests in formerly incarcerated artists to create original works of art that can further propel criminal justice reform efforts. He continues to make work about his experiences and has been an inspiration for others, including me, who wish to use art as a means of self-expression and therapy. Please welcome Russell. Hello everyone and thank you for coming. Um, I'm gonna use my 10 minutes to basically show you some of my work and explain what motivated me to make the work. But before I started doing art, I was in prison and I came up with the idea. I had art, it was like a thing I used to do as a kid. It was like a hobby. I was a foster kid, similar to Roach. And um, I winded up in prison a lot of times. So on my last day, I decided to be an artist. And I had that idea that if I take art and learn art, that I could you know, do that with my life. So I told myself how to read and write. Went to the library, got books on art, and the rest is history. I'm an artist now, so I'll walk you through some of my work. This right here is a, a painting I did for Merrill Arts when I first got out, and um, an artist named James Burns that works at Merrill Arts, a staff artist, respected artist, does a lot of portrait realism kind of work. And um, we did a mural uh, 120 feet in the air on Broad and Lehigh, Philadelphia. And uh, James didn't want to work with me right away. He wasn't like so, um, and so he had me do this paint. He was like, well, if you can do this paint, then you can work with us. So I did the painting. And, and then my second obstacle was to get 120 feet in the air. And I'm like, I'm not going up there. <laughs> so, you know, and then he kind of nicely let me know that if I didn't go up there, then he didn't have no need for me. So I was up there. <laughs> so that's basically what this um, picture explains. Then right here is a, a recreation of my uh, state ID. And the reason why, and I made it bigger, and if you can see, the little one is taped to it at the top. 
And then I underlined the art in the department because I use art as a tool to change my life around. And Nicole has purchased this speech piece off me, so they found a home with, with Nicole, and I appreciate that. But the reason what made me do this and, and make my ID bigger is because when you're in prison, HP 9290 becomes your identity. They don't call you by your name. And if you don't like sound off your number by request when the guards tell you to, it can result in penalty. Or if you lose your ID, it can, can result in penalty as well. They try to say you try to escape. So I wanted to highlight that. And it's like a reminder of me of like things that you deal with inside. This is a painting of an owl I did for no reason in the um, in a halfway house because they they allowed me to have paint. He wasn't supposed to have paint, so I just like felt like painting this owl. <laughs> this is me painting some wolves for for a client. No real meaning behind that either. And then before I was giving it to him, I had to I seen something that needed to be touched up, so I did a quick touch up real quick and told him not to like touch it, lay it, so it wouldn't get messed up. <laughs> This right here, um, Dr. Gene Wright from Philadelphia, he's like a psychiatrist. He had me do a painting um, for his poem, A Black Woman. So I uh, wrote the poem in cursive in green, black, and red, like to highlight like black culture. And um, and she's also pregnant with his, with his grandchild. Uh, so I wanted to, because he, he gave me the option to, to paint anything I want to go with the, the poem, and I chose to, to paint his, uh, his daughter. Cause, Cause, that was like a strong black woman getting life. It was like the image that I wanted to that I wanted to paint. Now, right here is like a private commission of um, someone wanted me to paint a mural in their their child's room, and they like basketball, so I did their favorite player on the wall. <laughs> this right here is me experimenting with. Um, I work in a lot of different mediums. I also taught myself how to do art, all uh, the painting and sculptural. This was like just me just playing around because when I was a kid I used to take Play-Doh and make stuff. So I would just try my hand at doing like a sculpture. So this is like one that I never did none after that, but I probably go back to it because it, it showed me that I could do it if I put my mind to it. Um, this is my first attempt at an abstract painting. I call it struggle because like the struggle that we go through as black people. So like the red, um, it's like the blood being spilled, like cops killing black people, getting away with it. The white is like the white supremacy and the black is us. And then if you look close, I had sold this painting, but if you was there in person, it has like chains that you can't see or thick applications of paint where the black's at that you can't see now, but you had to see it in person. Uh, that's a portrait of me, green, black, and red. No, no. That was for a client, a portrait. This is an interesting one. Eric Gardner, I walk the streets of Philadelphia and I pick up empty packs of cigarettes um, and painted Eric Gardner's portrait on it because the police, New York police, killed Eric Gardner for um, suspecting he, he wasn't even selling. People that know him contacted me once I put this on uh, Facebook from New York. It was like he wasn't even selling cigarettes. He sold cigarettes once upon a time and they was harassing him constantly. That's why if you watched that video before they killed him, he was like, why y'all always messing with me? And I screenshotted that face when he, when he said that. I didn't point, paint the portrait of like the, the face you always see. I screenshot when he was like, why y'all always messing with me? He said that because they was harassing him for a while. So it's sort of like if the police killed me right now, they'll say that I was a drug dealer, I was a criminal. But in the last 10 years, I've been like painting because I was in jail and I've been out for four and I'm like a painter now. But they could kill me and say I was a criminal once upon a time or he's still a criminal and get away with it. So that's what made me want to paint this. And that's just a paint, painting of a little girl off the internet and I believe she's like from Somalia and I did it in an impressive kind of a style pastel. No real meaning behind it, just style. And that's it. Thank you so much, uh, Russell. I think I can use the mic. Okay. Virginia Field, I'm going to sit you, see, please. Um, from panzas to prisons, from street theater to large-scale multimedia performances, from princess to shaka, Virginia Greece writes plays that are set in bars without windows, barrio rooftops, and lesbian bedrooms. Her play, Blue, was the winner of the 2010 Yale Drama Series Award and was recently published by Yale University Press. Her, her other published work, 
includes the Panza Monologues, co-written with Irma Mayorga, University of Texas Press, and an edited volume of Zapatista Communiques titled Conversations with Don Dorito. As a curator, artist, and activist, she's facilitated organizing efforts amongst women, immigrant, Chicano, working class, and queer youth. Virginia has taught writing for performance at the university level, as a public school teacher, in community centers, women's prisons, and in the Juvenile Correction Center. Please give her a warm round of applause. La prisión es otro país, dice Concha León Mora. We're sitting at a kitchen table in Mexico City days after the new year. A group of people, scholars who are artists, artists who are researchers, researchers who write plays, actors who act up, and a former political prisoner still fighting. We're gathered to discuss theater in Mexico 50 years after the student massacre of Tata Loco in 68, gender in the role of women in politics, the politics of memory, and prisons. We are a binational team of Mexicans, separated by a border we did not create. Prison is another country, she says, and we all shake our head in agreement, an understanding, a knowing, a memory. My body tightens up every time I make the drive to Huntsville, to San Bernardino, to Bradford, to Santa Marta, to Perryville. I go through the checklist. Do I have my papers? Can I see your ID? Are they up to date? Empty your pockets. Was I put on the list? This is your number. No open-toed shoes, no sleeveless shirts, no ripped jeans, no papers, no keys, no open-toed shoes, no sleeveless shirts, no ripped jeans, no papers, no keys. I walk through the metal detector. Prison is another country, she says. I learned this early. All of us sitting around the table learned this early. Visiting friends and family in and out of state and federal prisons in Texas, in California, in Arizona, in Pennsylvania. My earliest memory of writing are letters exchanged across prison walls. Baños painted in ink, poems tucked inside envelopes. A memory. The first poem I ever read publicly was in the juvenile detention center in Austin, Texas. I worked with the local arts organization in Austin to implement a series of writing workshops both at the high school where I taught and in the juvenile detention center. In this program, I met a 12-year-old who was functionally illiterate. One of the poets and my mentor, Raul Salinas, asked me to work with him one-on-one. -on -one. For two weeks, I would listen as he told me the story he wanted to tell, transcribed the words he dictated to me each day. Every night, the young man returned to his cell, paper tucked in the thrace band of his pants. With the help of his cellmate, he would memorize the words on the page before returning to class the next day. At the end of the program, he performed his story with the rest of the students, paper in hand. The night before the reading, he asked me, what about you, miss? What story are you going to tell tomorrow? Without thinking, I responded, I'm not a writer. Raul calmly, calmly walked up behind me and under his breath said, you better go home and watch yourself a poem, sister. <laughs> Once the street hustler, Raul became an internationalist in prison. He was locked up in Leavenworth at the same time as the Puerto Rican nationalist Rafael Cancel Miranda. In 54, in an attempt to raise visibility for the Puerto Rican independence movement, along with Rolito Lebron, Andres Figueroa Cordero, and Irving Flores Rodriguez, Miranda, armed with automatic weapons, launched an attack on Congress. Many Chicanos at Leavenworth, including Raul, made friends with the Puerto Rican independistas real quick and began organizing for better conditions in the prison from inside through a prison rights strike that landed them both in solitary confinement. These inter-ethnic and anti-colonial formations in Leavenworth were linked to a larger prison rights and anti-prison movement across the nation, but also to global rebellions all over the world. The prison rebellion was not just about reform, it was a collective act of self-defense, as well as a pointing to something beyond the bars and imagining of something, something better. Raul used to say, you know who your family was by the people who were next to you when the guards came in to knock heads, and who was there to care for you for your wounds after. I had forgotten this. My comrade Alan reminds me. Raul died in 2008. Ten years later, we sit at a table in Mexico City, a group of people, scholars who are artists, artists who are researchers, researchers who write plays, actors who act up, and a former political prisoner still fighting. Most of us have sat at this table before. Most of us sat at a table, not unlike this one, in Austin, Texas, days after the new year, inspired by an armed revolution in Chiapas. We asked ourselves, what can we learn from Mexico? What can Mexico teach us about revolution? 
We imagined struggle beyond solidarity, learned one no, many yeses, preguntando, caminamos, mandar, obedeciendo, a world where many words fit. Learned that we were semilleros, not knowing that those early days around the kitchen table in Raul's bookstore would bring us to this moment in Mexico 10 years after his death, 50 years after the global rebellions of 68. Prisons, both literal and metaphorical, the boxes people try to put us in, and state violence are tropes that recur in my writing and the performances I direct. I make theater in part as an attempt to liberate myself from confinement, conventional rules, norms, and structures, an attempt to imagine freedom. We are making theater together across borders we did not create. And I can talk about each of these projects in Mexico and in Arizona. In Mexico, we're creating a theater piece based on the life of uh, Nacha, who was a student organizer in 1968, in collaboration with the center there called Centro 77. And the center, one of the things that they do is work in a high, uh, high maximum security prison outside of Mexico City, a men's prison. And one of their um, goals is to work professionally with folks, to train people to be actors. And what they're able to do in Mexico is they're actually able to pay people for their work. And so the men that they work with are all paid to be actors. And so together with the center, we're creating a piece with La Nacha on the 1968 student rebellion and about her life story. In Perryville, we wanted to also work with that same era of 68 to do a mirror project. And so we're adapting a stage adaptation of Elena Maria Viramontes' Their Dogs Came With Them, which is a story about confinement in the United States. What is most important is what we are learning from each other. I think of our work as a rehearsal, a gathering of people across borders an imagining of something beyond the bars, the bars that we're trying to tear down. Sometimes this gathering is at a kitchen table, sometimes a classroom, sometimes a theater, sometimes a parole hearing, sometimes a prison. And the question we are asking is how can art set our people free? And we're trying to do this work in a place that is another country. The director asks a group of actors, what does occupation feel like, sound like, taste like, look like? They respond, gates and barbed wire, guns and dust, bleach and metal. I'm reminded of this as we wait for the officer to check our IDs at Perryville. Perryville, one of 13 prisons in Arizona off of I-10 in the small town of Goodyear, about 20 miles west of Phoenix, home of Judge Arapayo. We're there to talk about Vida Montes as their dogs came with them and to present scenes from the theatrical adaptation of the book. The women on the inside are reading the novel, and I ask a question that I typically begin all workshops with, what do you know? One of the women answers without hesitation, this is a story about hunger, and not just for food, but for something more, something greater. The following week in four separate groups, we began working on individual scenes, and I decided to stage the entire play as a ritual to end hunger. The story is going to be narrated by Voladores, a symbol of freedom, inspired by the Danza of Voladores, where the main dancer stands in the center of a large pole that's erected by the community, plays a flute, represents the sound of birds singing, and then four other men to spin around the pole to represent the recreation of the world and the regeneration of life, memory and understanding and knowing. And then the women work out ways to embody men that fly, some create simple yet beautiful gestures of one arm in the air moving as they speak, signifying flight, while others grab chairs with wheels on them and turn themselves upside down, flipping in and out of aerial spins, switch in and out of different registers of speech and language. Laughter fills the room as the women play the part of the F Troop, a group of gossiping girls named Ermila, Mousy, Weenie, Lolly, Loop de Loop. The role of the narrates, the only things they cherish, their only private property, are the stories that they continue to create and recreate in a world that gives them one to tell. And like the girls in the F Troop, we too cherish these stories. Memories of our father in Mexico, recognition of a mousy in our own crew, feelings invoked by a song. These collections of stories in the play are all told under the blades of the helicopters, a relentless policing of the neighborhood. Under the blades of the helicopters, in this country, not our own, for a brief moment, like the voladores, we are able to fly.
For a brief moment, we are able to transcend the gates and barbed wire, the guns and dust, the bleach and metal. For a brief moment, behind those walls, we were free. Really extraordinary, thank you. The Bravo is a New York-based media activist, educator, and filmmaker who's documented youth culture, hip-hop, and politics over the past two decades. During this time period, he initiated a series of arts and entertainment programs for adolescent and adult inmates at Rikers Island, New York's largest detention center. From 2000 to 2009, he curated films and produced live music events that reached in excess of 10,000 inmates. In 2009, Bravo co-produced Estilo Hip Hop, a PBS broadcast documentary film that chronicled the rise of hip hop activism across Chile, Brazil, and Cuba. Bravo has also served as media educator and consultant for a variety of arts and filmmaking educational institutions, including the Global Action Project, Urban Arts Partnership, and the Maisels Institute, where he served as the education director from 2009 to 2011. While at the Tribeca Film Institute, he steered a cross-section of filmmaking programs that serviced over 18,000 public school students and teachers. Thank you. I'll keep this brief. Thank you to the moderator of panelists. Uh, wonderful stories of uh, resiliency and triumph. Um, I'll start with this. Um, I arrived to this country when I was seven years old, 1981, from Chile. Um, into um, Far Rockaway, Queens. I'm a native New Yorker. Um, and I moved into a Section 8 building. And uh, I vividly remember getting invited by like other black and brown kids to the fifth floor, the sixth floor, for like a party. And it was always like a, like a coming home party. And uh, I never really understood what that meant, but I knew that it would be adults, drinking, having fun, eating cake, right? Um, and as I got older, I began to realize that these were coming home parties for people that were coming home from prison. Uh, and there were plenty of them. Um, so to me, it was the most normal thing uh, in the building. Because you're a kid. You know, you don't get a blueprint to understand the criminal justice system. You participate in it through your interaction with your friends, family, and community. Um, so by the time I, uh, I was 14 and then my, my stepdad went to prison, and at 15 my stepbrother went to prison, as a one immigrant son in the family who had command of English, you are in front of the criminal justice system, like in the bear, like, you know, communicating with attorneys, with judges, being an interpreter, and that is the life for many immigrant people, uh, and many immigrant, young, young immigrant people that come to this country. You become a facilitator by default, and then you start to interact with the system, with no blueprint, and you gotta figure it out as you go along. So by the time I made the intentional decision to become uh, a journalist, and uh, we created a magazine with some college friends called Stress Magazine in the mid-90s, and then we started getting letters from guys at Rikers Island, uh, I said to myself, well, we should just publish them. But then publishing them wasn't enough. The idea was to then create a space for them to develop their voices, and we developed uh, a prison column um, called Tales from the Rock. And over five years, we received over 10,000 submissions from people just wanting to tell their story. Um, and to me, you know, I began this process of communicating with people on the inside. Um, and for the people that know me, they will tell you that will never be enough for me. Like, can we peel the layer and go deeper? Um, and then hence, I, I started a relationship with Rikers Island, um, a, a programmatic relationship with them <laughs> in the late 90s. Um, to um, bring live hip hop acts, you know, in, into the into Rikers Island, uh, you know, at, at, at the premium years, Wu Tang Clan, uh, Tupac Shakur, uh, the Fugees, um, Mob Deep, uh, um, inside the prison, um, communicating not only to um, people that were locked up, but also to the people who worked in corrections. Uh, we always realized that this just more than one audience, you know, through the walls. Uh, and if folks are familiar with New York City, uh, the corrections officers that uh, police the people in jail also come from the same neighborhoods uh, where people are, are come from. So, um, you know, the idea was to just engage, create a dialogue. Um, and then through that experience, uh, I realized that uh, 
filmmaking and storytelling could have a role. And I remember we were doing a show um, at, at, at the Beacon um, at Rikers Island, and I asked one of the corrections officers, hey, there's, a, there's a, a screening here. Does it ever go down? And he says, I've never seen it go down in you know, the 30 years that I've been here. So I realized there were like untapped resources in prison. Um, and then hence, in 2000, started bringing in films, elbowing my way into the programs department. Um, and um, lo and behold, by the time I you know, become a documentary filmmaker and start working with the independent film community, um, I get the bright idea of asking uh, one of the wardens at Rikers Island, um, who I knew was looking for a program for young women of color, are you interested in teaching young women of color how to like film? Um, or make a movie? And she says, absolutely no, we can't bring cameras in here. And I said, we're talking about bringing cameras. I see that you have about 20, um, you know, laptops sitting there unused. You know, we can um, upload Final Cut Pro, we can bring stock footage, and we can start teaching young women how to like edit films. And they were like, oh, I didn't know like you could do that. Again, you know, people have an interest, but think that filmmaking is all about bringing in a camera and exposing everything that's bad. This is just about creating and giving someone like a tool, like a paintbrush, like a book. And for me at that point, I realized that like, while mass incarceration needs to end, and, and it needs to end soon, there are still a lot of people sitting in prison while we do that. So I decided to make an intentional decision to become like a connecting artist, right? So uh, while there is critical thought in art, the idea was to like, let's just create and imagine another world. And we're not here to have you ladies think about like what's going on in prison all the time. This is for you to imagine the world that you want to live in. If you are the daughter of someone, if you're someone's parent, right? How can you communicate in a humane way through the art? How can you project yourself onto another community? So we did that for a couple of years, and then um, after a while, the young women got tired of like using stock footage, and they were like, "Hey, we want to like write our own film." So we introduced storyboarding, and then we have like these great short stories, and then who's going to produce the films? So I contacted one of the schools, uh, the Young Women's Leadership of Astoria in Queens, which is in the same congressional district as Ry at Rikers, and I met a forward-thinking educator who was interested in teaching um, mass incarceration through photography. And I was like, are you interested in like, moving over to the video? She said, sure. And then lo and behold, uh, we got permission, and it took some time, so the storyboards that the young women at Rikers were developing were then shared with an 11th grade class in Queens who then underwent a curriculum of like understanding the other, right? How do you get to tell someone's story by like doing active listening and doing like the exchange of ideas analog, right? Because in prison you don't have access to the internet, computers, you have to write everything. So then we created like a, a pen pal exchange between 19 year olds at Rikers and 15 year olds in Queens. And if you know a thing about Queens, it's the rainbow. It's like the Middle East, South Asia, the Caribbean, <laughs> Central America, right? Eastern Europe, South America, all in one room. And that was fantastic. Um, and I'll finish off with this. We ran that program for about six years. Um, and during that process, I realized that um, there were people at Rikers Island who also had family members that were actively incarcerated, like parents and grandparents. And then I started to ask questions, well, where are they? And I got a map of like the entire like penal system in New York State. Um, and then I kind of like took the idea of the collaborative filmmaking program between Rikers and the school, and then shipped that over to Otisville Correctional Facility, which is a medium security in upstate New York, and Shawangan Correctional Facility, which is a maximum. Um, and there, uh, this past year, um, um, seven of my students, all of whom had been serving life sentences, I think combined they were like close to having served 150 years, um, they put together a script, which we then shared with um, Art and Design High School, which is one of the you know, pioneer art film schools in the city, and uh, their senior class uh, produced a 10 minute short film uh, which we're in the post-production stages. And um, just to kind of bring it back to like the need to politicize things, when we were in that classroom, I, uh, the only prompt that I gave them was, you guys are watching CNN, you see what's happening with Eric Garner, you see what's happening in Baltimore, you see what's happening across the country. This is your opportunity to write yourselves into that narrative. 
and they wrote a short film called Unbecoming, which is their take on the Black Lives Matter movement from the inside as told through the perspective of a brother and sister uh, who are on opposite ends of, 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 that, of, 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 of Black Lives Matter. And, um, and the beautiful thing, and I'll leave everything with this, is that while they were writing, they went before the parole board, and one by one, they were all released. And they were able to come home this summer after serving 25 to 37 years in prison and direct the films that they wrote. And I think some of them are in here, I can't tell, but if they're in here, please make yourself known to these folks after the panel, because there's some incredible men that I work with. I see them over there, I love our idea. Um, and I forgot to go through the slides, so I'll quickly go through the slides and then I'll end. Uh, three minutes. Three minutes. Okay, this is um, Rosie Zam Singer. This is the facility that houses uh, women um, at Rikers Island. Uh, we're with a group of filmmakers from a wonderful film called South West of Salem. Um, these are our young students at Rikers Island. Uh, they're in the kitchen. And what's interesting about this picture is that um, as our guys are coming home from like the medium security prisons and maximum security prisons, they send them to take courses at hostels and other colleges, and then we're getting text pictures because they'll meet someone from our Rikers program, and then they'll be like, oh yeah, you did this program, I did this program, let's take a picture, and then they send it to us. And, and, and you can't script that. You can't script that, that, that type of interconnectedness. Um, these are our students from the high school producing the film that came out of Rikers. Um, we did the first ever like film screening uh, at Rikers Island where we actually bust in uh, a high school of students and the warden tells me the last time we had high school students at Rikers was in 89 when they used to do the Scare Street program. Mm -hmm. So this is the first time that they actually brought young people you know, to connect with each other by screening their work in front of like, the audience. And it was wonderful. E even the corrections officers were like baking cookies and muffins for them. <laughs> um, this is inside the correctional facility at the screenings that we um, hold there every month. Um, this is Alejo Rodriguez, El Sun White, and the, the late Chaz Ransom. Um, Alejo Rodriguez is in the back somewhere. Um, but these were the founding members of a program that we created at the Tribeca Film Institute called the Community Screening Series. And these men were largely responsible for curating films, engaging men in real deep dialogue about um, not only humanity, but the Black Lives Matter movement, um, all the issues pertaining to the LGBTQ community on the inside and um, obviously, you know, all the other things that are important to them. Um, this is um, the men from Watersville Correctional Facility with a couple of filmmakers, uh, more filmmakers, and this is the production crew from Art and Design High School that, um, this is when they wrapped up the last shoot for the film on Becoming. And, uh, and that's the three men once they were liberated, um, and this is from last year. And um, this is some filmmakers working the red carpet, and these are our, our <laughs> two of our students from um, Ordersville Correctional Facility who came home and had a chance to meet my old boss, Mr. De Niro. Um, and I'll leave it at that. Thank you. You all are truly an extraordinary group. Uh, thank you so much for sharing a little bit about your work uh, with all of us. I think there's so many potential points of departure to, to begin with, but I think what's, uh, what's most awakened in me is the desire to know more about who you all are as individuals and what your journey to this kind of work was. Some of you alluded to it a bit in your um, presentations, but I wonder, was there a moment where you decided that this is what you're going to commit your life to. Because this kind of work is so much broader than just a career path. Um, so perhaps I'll ask you to start and then we'll just go down the line. That's, such a, that's a hard question. Um, I, I, I started teaching inside San Quentin Prison because I, 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 I was interested in how people, I've always been interested in how people find meaning and um, how they find self-worth and, and again, what's worthy of preservation. And I was curious about how does that happen when you're locked away from society and demonized. And so that's why I went in as a teacher. And through that, I just started having conversations with men and felt like 
I, I was so sad to see, I, I hate wasted potential, and to see so much wasted potential inside prison was, was a horrible thing, and uh, I felt like, boy, th that needs to change, and, and you know, obviously that's something a lot of people feel, but I felt like I could work um, and collaborate with men inside and use storytelling as a way um, to address that issue in, so, in somewhat of a quiet way through personal experience. And I'm 54 years old and I feel like when I started doing this maybe six years ago that I found what I want to do with the second part of my life. However long I have left, um, that's what I want to do. And it's invigorating for me and it's exciting to see people awaken to their potential. It's great. To answer that question, I kind of spoke on it a little bit, but I'll speak more on it. When I was in prison, I started to notice like the environment and like my situation. Like I started to like open my eyes to like continuously being in prison because it wasn't my first time. I went a couple times and then being in there, a lot of the guys wasn't focused. They was kind of like either stuck in like this mentality that they were still in the streets. They would like huddle in the corner just like they would on a street corner or engage in like chess and all this stuff. So that's why I use um, art as like a, a tool or like a vessel to navigate out of that lifestyle, street life, once I would, whenever I would get out and even like in the prison. So it was like an escape and a, a plan to like change things. And then after I started doing art and got out and landed an art kind of job, I started to think to take my art and try to make it have meaning. So then I started paying attention, which I couldn't ignore like the situations that we deal with as black people, it's like a lot of struggle that we go through, a lot of injustice. Uh, black Lives Matter, they put their like title, but it's like they they don't think that our lives matter. So, and it don't seem like it gets the attention that it should get. So my little self of doing painting, touching on issues, not going too crazy, I don't think, but I can't do nothing. So that's like what fuels me. I told the story of when I became a writer, but my earliest memory of writing is writing letters to people in prison. And those were the moments that I remember sharing stories. It was the moments that I remember crafting um, narratives, um, reading other people's stories. And, um, and, and it's my earliest memory. And I feel that for me, politically, I always had a commitment to do work in prisons. Um, and that, that, that commitment was, was more political than anything else because I felt like it was, it was needed and it was important. Uh, in the past, really in the past five years, I've made the commitment to work in one prison. And that's in part because I'm interested in what are the long-term relationships that we create. Uh, so the question of how does art set our people free, it isn't a metaphor. It, it really is how, how do we go to the parole meetings? You know, how, how do we do those things and get our people out? And so I think that for me that has been a commitment to um, working in one prison and to also making the connections to other people that are doing work that I respect across the border in Mexico City. Uh, and I think that that's what the next that's a, a beginning point for me, and so I feel like that's what the next couple of years will look like for me. Uh, thanks for that. Um, briefly for me, I think um, growing up I didn't have strong uh, Latino male models in my family or my community, and uh, it's just it's just ironic that you you grow up to be like an adult man and then you find the wisdom um, that you were lacking as a child in all the men in prison. Um, and, and, and once I began to realize that, you know, then my commitment became threefold. Because then I was honest with myself and realized that I'm also benefiting from this tremendously. This, is, this isn't about just helping someone who's on the other side. You realize that you are gaining personally. And then once you hit that zone, when you create a community, you start dreaming and thinking about the possibilities and the men that you're working with and women respond to that, then you know that it's bigger than you. Then you know that it's gonna transcend the job that you're in, the space that you're in, and it becomes movement work over the course of your life. And it, it took me a while to get there, but now I just, it's wherever I go, I wind up like talking about this stuff, you know, and, and, and doing it. Mm -hmm. 
Um, in the clip that you shared from the podcast, uh, one of the things that really struck me was when they were comparing a really imaginative question. Um, but it, was, it struck kind of a poignant note with me as I was listening to it because of children who made a mistake. And I think one of the ways that we have this behemoth of an industry functioning in the way that it does in this country is because we fundamentally stripped people of their humanity. Russell, you talked about that when you were talking about being referred to as a number instead of a name, right? What stories come to mind for you as you think about how people fight back against this dehumanization, against this um, attempt to, to render us as animals? So what specific stories that were doing? Well, I think one of the things that I really love about that sequence where the guys answer what kind of animals they would be is that you get something about their personality, their fear, their, their fears and hopes, their dreams in, in a very easy question. They're not just saying, I want to be a cat or a dog. Um, one guy talks about being a, a jellyfish because he'd have no natural enemies. Another guy talks about being an animal that doesn't talk and is quiet and observed. So I didn't think of that question as a way of, of looking at them as animals. I thought of it as a way of them expressing a deeper idea of who they are. But in general, our stories are about very small details that make up a life um, and, and examine the day-to-day -day inside and show commonality between inside and outside people. And I think when you can show commonality, that's the way you start breaking down a barrier. So our first story was about how do you find a cellmate? How do you find somebody to live with? And that, that's a question that anybody can, can engage in, whether you're trying to live with a sibling or a partner or a roommate. And there's complications doing that inside, and there's complications doing that outside. So it allows people that maybe don't have any prison experience to start putting themselves in someone else's position and creating empathy and um, self-reflection. So I don't, I don't know if that answers your question, but that's what, we're, that's what we're trying to do. Our stories aren't overtly political, but they are because they're talking about human experience. And so we get, you know, we, we, I think we work around to get to that. And because we're working inside of a prison and we have to deal with a huge, you know, the complex of being in a prison, how do, how do we get the stories out that we want that kind of chip away at the institution while not getting shut down? It's hard. Anybody else want to contribute to that? How do we fight back against dehumanizing nature of, of prisons? Real quick, um, like every day of my life, I try to be like an example to show people that I am not that monster that they like try to keep me as. Like even though for 10 years or so, I haven't committed any crimes, but you know, some people that stigma of like my past or being a felon stays, but every day I wake up and it's beyond just the art I do for my job. I just try to be as decent as I can be and I'm not perfect, you know, I might do something that's messed up, but not to the point where you should hate me or deem me as like this crazy dude. And I'm not the only one that serving this example. So if you pay attention, and then if you don't like like people, just close your eyes and, and listen, you probably love me. <laughs> based in personal stories and telling your own narrative. And one of the things that's been interesting for me is over the past year and working in Perryville, what women have sort of said to me repeatedly is that we don't want to tell our own stories. That's actually not the thing that we want to do. And I feel like that was a conversation that was able to have because there is a continuing relationship, right? And so you are beginning to work in collaboration. It's not a program that you be, you bring, but it is it is a conversation that's being had. And what people really wanted to do was to have a moment where they could step outside of themselves. And I felt like that for me was something that was very powerful about theater is that it allowed this moment in which people could step outside of themselves where they could create their own narratives and where they could dream. And uh, what I'm learning a lot from the work that's happening in Mexico is this idea of like, what does it mean to actually treat people as actors? Mm -hmm. And so the process has now sort of shifted to real training of like, what, is, what does a voice mean? How do we control our voice? How do we, and, and in theater, that really is about how we are, how we embody other characters, but how are we in our own body? And I think that there's something really uh, powerful about that in a place that polices your body to be able to 
create work that is about being open, you know? And I also feel like there's a danger in that. So there's conversations that we've had to have in terms of vulnerability and those types of things that have effects on the yard, right? Um, Virginia, you had a phrase um, in your work, an attempt to imagine freedom. And um, it, it calls to mind to me this Arundhati Roy quote where she said, another world is not just possible, but she's on her way. And on a quiet day, I can hear her breathing. What other kinds of models might we use? We have such a hyper-reliance on a punitive model in this country to the point where we're the leading incarcerator in the world. Um, what about restorative justice? What other models might we employ to, to address the crisis that we have uh, in this country? Um, uh, my, my colleague, Boz Drazinger, said it best a couple of years ago. She said, prison is, is a lazy way of um, doing conflict resolution in our community. Um, I myself, uh, my 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 father was uh, my biological dad was was murdered, and the people behind his crime um, served life sentences. Um, and um, I knew that part of doing this work was to be able to see those people as multidimensional human beings, right? Because growing up, I also saw myself and my community making tough decisions with real consequences. So in practice, you know, you have to actually like do that. Like you have to see people as multidimensional human beings. And um, when the situation calls for it, sometimes it means that you have to step aside, right? And like your, your centeredness becomes the centeredness of someone else. Um, so in the work that we I've done in the in the medium and maximum security you know um, situations I mean prisons um, I've had to learn to you know like step away and you know allow different perspectives to like shape the narrative and let the narrative go wherever it may go in conversation um, and I realize that it's important for folks who are on the inside to actually project their ideas onto other people something that. We do it, we take for granted every day. Whenever we talk to somebody, we're constantly projecting what we believe onto you, right? I'm doing it right now, right? So um, just being cognizant of, you know, that people occupy multiple spaces at once. But when you're in prison, right, you think of like, well, this person has gone through this, and they're feeling like this, so they're gonna do this. Sometimes you just gotta allow yourself to just go with the flow, you know? And, and I'm sure that everybody here who's worked on the inside, you discover something about yourself every day when you walk in there, you know? Um, so I don't know if there's a model for that, because I don't know if you, you can create a model for that, uh, because I don't think we do that effectively in the free world, mm -hmm. you know? I've, 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 done, I've learned more on the inside than I sometimes I do on the outside, people on their phones, people don't pay attention to you, they're not present in conversation, you know? So I, I don't even think we have the answer out here, to be quite frank. Well, sure. I was gonna say, and I think that there's something to that, that we don't have the answer out here. And so what does it mean to ask people on the inside what the answer is, you know? And I feel like there, is um, a way in which we warehouse people in this country. And so the prison, you know, growing up in Texas wasn't in my neighborhood or near my neighborhood. My relatives were sent far away. And so then there's a severing that happens and a warehousing that happens. And what are the ways in which people solve problems on the inside? What, what are the solutions that people on the inside have to problems on the outside? Those separations have to be eliminated, whether they're borders, whether they're prison walls, whether we have to find ways to eliminate those now. And so how do we how do we create work that transcends the inside outside binary? Anybody else? Anyone? Okay, let's open it up to the crowd. I'm sure that there's a number of questions here in the audience that people would like to ask. Is there anybody who would like to raise your hand? And also, do we have mics in the audience? How will this work? Yes. I just want to thank everyone for all of your work. 
Uh, my question is about restorative justice. Just in general, uh, a huge component of restorative justice is about restoring justice between victim and, and perpetrator. And I'm just wondering, in the work that you guys have done, have you, do you feel an obligation to, uh, to restore uh, the relationship between perpetrator and victim? And have you ever experienced uh, any kind of harassment or assault from the families of victims uh, of uh, families of, uh, victims and friends of crime? Um, that's something that we think a lot about on the podcast, and that, that we have a responsibility to people who have been harmed inside and outside. And one thing that's been fascinating to me and very heartwarming is that we hear from a lot of victims of crime, victims of very violent crimes, and all of the feedback has been of gratitude for having the opportunity to hear a different side and to see people inside in a more, as we said, a more complex and three-dimensional way. Um, that, that really shocked me. And in, in San Quentin, they, they also hold a lot of restorative justice circles, and so I've, I've been to them and witnessed them, and it's an incredibly powerful experience to see the interaction between survivors and, and people who have committed crimes. Um, I think it's an important and very difficult work. Um, and since I've never been a victim of a violent crime, I don't like to comment too much on what it's like, but to observe it and to talk to people about it is, um, it's kind of a magnificent thing, as painful as it is. Um, I work in restorative justice with Mural Arts, and the crimes that I committed, there was no like victim as far as like uh, violence. Um, when I was committing crimes, I was a hustler, like selling controlled substances and things like that. So it's like many people, so I wouldn't know who to go and like try to correct my wrongs with them. But as far as the Merle Arts Program, we make murals in the community and try to beautify communities that's been like messed up and things like that and work with young youths that's committing crimes and things like that and try to turn them around, and uh, but not like a one-on-one -on -one with the victim. So that would be like a, a violent, and it was this one gentleman who shot a guy in a, in a program, and his mom and the guy was uh, paralyzed, and then the mom forgave him, so they had like a whole like, like you know, like unity, and then, then, then the perpetrator became like her new son. So that happened in the Merle Arts. So that's like the only example I can give. In the work that I do specifically in terms of theater work, I never ask or talk to people about why they are incarcerated. Uh, that it's just not the work that I'm doing. Not oh, cool. <laughs> okay, any other questions from the audience? Thank you for your presentation. Um, how do you deal with the forces in the industry of prison and the unions of prison workers that affect the laws that are being passed that will essentially add to the number of people in prison? That's a big force that you have to work against. Uh, there's an economy there that people that depend on prisons for a living, and there's some of the pictures out there show communities that are dependent upon prisons. So there's kind of a force working against it. Me and a good friend of mine, Jesse Crimes, he's also a fellow artist that was formerly incarcerated. We have a project coming up um, in Philadelphia where uh, we're gonna co lead artists. And um, one of the topics that we would wanna like highlight is like cash bail reform, cause like bail be like crazy high. And when you like poor, like you can't even like, there's no way you getting out. They make sure it's like so high you don't get out. So. We like little fish, but we trying to like make art like that, like scream at those people you talk about, and then hopefully like somebody do something. So that's what we trying to do. It's like a big mural, not just my personal painting. So that's like our attempt. Uh, for me, I would say um, working in prison and and um, interacting with people at all levels, you realize that it is. An economic engine, um, and many people benefit from it. You know, they say that 
in New York State, it's $60,000 per person who is incarcerated. But when you zoom out that picture and you look at all the people that stand to benefit from the 60 Gs, that's just a little bit of seed capital for people to make millions from you know, the surveillance technology that's being uh, introduced to certain communities, the militarization of police here in New York City, um, down to the very non-for-profit industrial complex that many of us are part of, down to all the people that provide the food, the clothing, you know, um, the steel. Um, and I think it's gonna take a concerted, concerted effort by filmmakers to begin to tell that story, right? Because it is a systems analysis. Um, I think the individual stories of like the pain and suffering of families and individuals is vital, but that can't be void of a structural analysis. Um, and it's up to us as photographers, people who work in these mediums, to begin to like zoom out of just like the individual pain and, and, and look at patterns. I saw a hand over here. I just had a question. How do you deal or did you have to deal with censorship of uh, the wardens, the administrators of the prisons? Do they ever get involved in your work? Uh, questioning it or wanting to review it before it's uh, it's put out. Um, we we do have all of our work for the podcast has to be reviewed by the public information officer at San Quentin Prison before it goes out, and he's in, he's in an interesting position. Um, he. He listens for accurate, for factual accuracy. He doesn't um, censor for um, artistic intention or story narrative. There hasn't been a story that we wanted to tell that's been that, that's been turned down. So I'm I'm quite surprised by it. But of course, there's also self censorship. There's stories that we would want to do that we know probably wouldn't get out. And so I think it's a really, to answer it honestly, it's very complicated. Mm -hmm. But I think we have much more permission than people would expect. And I've talked to public information officers at other prisons and they always tell me if, if this podcast proposal had come across my desk, I would have said that there's no way this is ever going to happen. But now that I've heard it, I'm interested in trying to start something like that. So. I think we've made a, a small victory with getting it out, but you know, of course, it does it does get reviewed. Um, I had something recently that happened in terms. Um, I was handing out scenes, and I handed out a scene to two women who, the two women who I know to be lovers, and uh, the scene was between. And I, I didn't purposely did this. I just sort of handed out the scenes, right? And so these two women got a scene that is a scene between a boy and a girl. And in the scene, um, the boy kisses the girl, right? So it's a, a thing that happens in the in the play in the scene. And um, and to be honest, I didn't I didn't think about it. I didn't think twice about it. And uh, you know, and everybody's playing different genders, and everybody's doing all sorts of things. And uh, the women looked at me, and they were like, we. We can't do this, <laughs> and um, and I said, oh, and you know, and immediately I thought it was the kissing that was the issue, you know, and then they pointed to the cameras, right, and said, we can't do this, and I was like, oh, it's not the kissing, it's the it's the policing of the kissing that's the problem, and so you know, theatrically, the question then became, well, how do you represent a kiss without a kiss? Right, and so then what it allowed for was another type of expression in terms of how do we, if, if that's the stage direction, then how do we embody that in a different way? So what does a kiss look like if it's not actually a kiss, right? One quick anecdote, uh, about a year and, and a half ago, we screened a beautiful independent film called Gun Hill Road, which is a story of um, a, a guy coming home from prison to learn that his teenage son is undergoing uh, a sexual operation, um, and he's beginning to identify as transgender. And uh, I played the film for the administration, and they were like, "No way! Like nudity. We have, you know, people in there that may be sex offenders." But to the credit of the men who created the program, and I encourage you guys to meet Mr. Rodriguez, who is censor. Alejo, can you please raise your hand one more time? Yeah. Okay. Um, the administration had seen them work and facilitate, you know, incredible conversation. But then I asked, you know, 
the administration, you've seen the guys work. They can handle it. And then they allow for the film to play. And that's a testament to you know, the power of them as a group, as a collective, to own the space, negotiate the space with everyone in there. And sometimes you get these blessings. They allow for the film to play. And it went without a, a hitch. So part of it is just imagining that things will go OK. <laughs> They're not going to say no. I think we have time for one more question. I can't see to the back, but is there anybody 30 and under who would like to have a question in the conversation? I just want to make space. Hi, um, I think my question is slightly related to the last one, but I was curious about your experience with rejection. Um, if it, sort of both when you're dealing or proposing projects with people on the inside, the administration, but also rejection that you've dealt with for your work on the outside. Um, this seems to be a very supportive community, but I imagine that the work is maybe not always easily received. I can speak to that a little bit. Um, for when I attempt to bring it light to an issue, I've been learning that I need to be more sh suggestive, like not to bam in your face or be seen as so like, oh, I'm so mad, I'm this mad black boy. So, um, so partially that's like my fault that I need to be more creative and getting it across. And then you have to think and be more subtle. But there here has been like rejection sometimes because it, it was too heavy. Please join me in giving a warm round of applause to our panelists. Thank you so, so much. And also, I'd like to say thank you to the Aperture Foundation.